Welcome to Discovering. Kristen was back with Emmett Friedley, this time for a look at trapping. The kids kind of bears. That's species together. Then part one of our series on building this beautiful birch bark canoe. The secret streams that flow beneath the cliffs of colored stone. Forest thick and healthy with birch and pine and oak. Surrounded by the greatest lakes this world has ever known. The black bear's awesome presence as he roams the hills and fields. Call of the timber wolf, the loon's lonesome trill. The eagle soaring high above, the trout lies deep and still. These are what I treasure. The only way I measure feelings that I have for this fine land. There is so much to discover when you're a long time lover of northern Michigan. Last month, we showed you a story about Emmett Friedley, a six-year-old boy who loves to fish. But fishing isn't the only outdoor activity Emmett enjoys. Onward and ponward to catch muskrat. <laughs> Emmett's father, John Friedley, is teaching Emmett to trap. Nothing. Oh, why don't you pull that one straight up? Nothing. Nothing and hand it back. I caught up with the father-son duo on a crisp, calm October morning as they checked their muskrat traps. We arrived at the creek just as the sun was rising and Emmett was eager to get on the water. Here we push. Mm -hmm. <laughs> A thin layer of ice had formed around the muskrat houses and food beds where they had placed their traps the day before. Emmett pulled the traps while his dad drove the boat. Daddy, you miss it. We got to turn around and I pull it out a little bit for you and then you pull it out. Okay. And that's a jump trap, right? Yep. He's learning about the different types of traps, how to set them, and what to use for bait. This is a kind of bear shatter. Oh, what does that do? It treads kind of bears. Uh -huh. Like, it locks them in and push them. Like, right like this. And you squeeze it. It's that squeezes together. And like you put the apple right there. Snap. What kind of trap is that? A spring trap. A jump trap. Jump trap. What kind of bait do you use for catching muskrats? Apple. Apple. This is muskrat like smeller. Yeah. What does that do? Tracks muskrat. What's it called? Muskrat smell. Muskrat lure? Muskrat lure. Do you put that on all your traps? No, we put it on apples. Uh, apples, that's muskrat. What do you put on 
by our beaver traps. Beaver smell. Beaver smell, yeah, beaver smell. We checked a few traps with no success. There you go, bud. Thank you. We're not very good trappers, huh? We haven't caught anything yet. But these are nice and easy for him to get to, and that's what it's all about, just having him get out and get the experience. And I think we got nothing to our old down deep. I'm just waiting in the ship. Tell me how you, how you trap muskrats. You like put the stick in by their habitat, then put a trap on it. Then you like go back to her house. Then you like wait for a couple days to get a little bit more water. You like catch a muskrat. How many muskrat did you catch today? One. That's right, we didn't get skunked. Halfway through the traps, there finally was a muskrat. You got it, Drake. Go. That is a, this is a great trap. Yeah, this is gonna be a stop loss trap. Remember the stop loss trap has a little bar that comes over and holds their leg down after they get caught? Like that? Yeah. This is our fourth muskrat. It's your fourth muskrat, yeah. Hi. Emmett and John had caught a few muskrats the day before. We finished pulling the traps on the creek, loaded the boat back up. One, two, three. <coughs> and we were off to the next spot to check more muskrat and beaver traps. Where are we going? Do you got anything in there? In your trap there? No. Let me see there. Yeah. And what kind of trap do you have down there? You got a little conna bear down there where it goes into a little culvert. Mm. You check the other side out. You want to pick it up, see what we got? Okay, I'll help you. Mm -hmm. Step on over. Yeah. Oh, look at that. What's that? You got a muskrat. Wow, that's a big one, too. It is heavy. You want to see? Yeah. Okay. How about you put your basket down and we'll put it in it. We'll show her how you... Take this off then, huh? Okay. Get it right like that. Keep squeezing hard. Okay, I'll help you set this. And what is this for? Got it there. That's our safety so we don't get our fingers pinched, see? I can let go of this now. Oh, that's a big one, too. He's got big teeth. He's got big teeth, yeah. Why? We're chewing on roots. Now, do you want to come set this down here? You want to put it back in the culvert like yesterday? By yourself? Yep, you can do it, remember? 
that's got the safety on, so we'll put it in this way, okay? I do it by myself. Yep, I'll take the safety off for you. Okay, we'll turn it sideways like this. That, this right here, so they swim through, remember? You want to take this off like this? And we're all set. He did. No, what is that? That makes them so he goes through it like that. Remember? You sat there last night, so they crawl right through there. Good job. But not like that. Yep, not like that. They don't go up to the side. Um, yep. <laughs> Good job. That put Emmett's weekend muskrat total to five. We circled the pond to check on a couple beaver traps Emmett and John had put out on the beaver highways Emmett found. A beaver trail. <laughs> Look, it has a big opening there. Look. It, <laughs> it is flat. It is not flesh still. Where is the beaver? He must have stepped on the side of it and sprung it off. Where did it go? Oh, he's back swimming around. No beaver. The beaver got it with a stick. See how it was carrying a stick down? He set her off. No luck today, but that wasn't the case the day before when they caught two beavers. Overall, it was a successful weekend of trapping for this father and son. Okay, where do you put it at? It's awesome to see young kids learning old traditions like fur harvesting and just being outdoors, breathing fresh air, and spending quality time with dad. This beautiful handmade birch bark canoe is destined for the water. But to fully appreciate the experience, we first need to witness how those who built it, along with the forest and the river, all came together to create this amazing piece of functional art. Before we look at the how, we need to look at who. Meet John and Victoria Youngworth. I hesitate to use the generalized and in recent years cheapened term off the grid, which refers to living in a self-sufficient manner without reliance on one or more public utilities. While that is certainly true, it by no means even begins to give you a taste of the lifestyle that John and Victoria have chosen. Ever since I can remember, that's all I've ever wanted to do was to live in the middle of the woods, far from everything. I even wanted to just be able to canoe in to a place and just live like that, maybe three portages in or a day's travel or something like that. I, I did have that. And that's, that was my chosen career probably since I was eight years old or something. The journey here begins on a remote blacktop road, which soon turns to gravel, and then to a two-rut road. The final stretch is on foot to the remote and very, very quiet cabin in the high country of the Upper Peninsula. Um, I definitely over the years feel I, I um, without even knowing, I was developing the skills that it takes to live like this. So um, maybe without even uh, without an idea that at the end of it we'd end up here, I was all I I was automatically picking up the skills that it took to um, to live like this, and then we came here slowly, picking up more of those skills along the way, so that by the time we actually moved here, we could you know live comfortably and and build a house and raise the children and do all that do all that that it takes to yeah to live this lifestyle there was a brief time in high school and I thought I was going to do like a regular career like a job job but I bailed on that as soon as I got smart again <laughs> and so the day after I got out of high school I jumped in the car with a canoe on top with my buddy and we went up to Hudson Bay in the canoe and started exploring Canada. And every summer after that, we would explore Canada. It was important to me that the lifestyle that we chose is one that 
we could keep doing forever um, and that actually everyone in the world could do too if the world was organized differently. John and Victoria build canoes the traditional way, the way their Ojibwe Indian predecessors did in this same region many years ago. I started a birch bark canoe when I was 18 after I left home. And I started carving to pieces and, and after I made my first piece I realized I had a long way to go so I gave up on that and went out and bought a plastic canoe. But I always had that in the back of my mind that I, I, was, I would like to have the skills to build a canoe. So what does it take to build a birch bark canoe? Not just build one, but do it without all of the conventional conveniences offered by more connected locations. We're about to find out. This is the boat that we'll be building. This one's about, I don't know, 15 years old, and this is our old beater. We want to see how they die so we don't be that nice to it. We just keep using it. This piece of bark here will turn into this boat here. This is the same boat that we're building because we use the same form for it. So you need a piece at least 10 feet long, four foot wide to be nice, but how do you find a tree that big? Got to be thick barks. Maybe one in a thousand trees has the kind of bark that you need for that kind of stuff. There's only a few weeks a year that it peels off nice and you have to weight it down because the bark wants to curl up into a big tube. So we unrolled that the other day with a bunch of hot water because you store it in big rolls. That's probably 10 years old. Keeps good. I mean, for us, it's like money in the bank. You can get it on a logging site before they log it. All we want is the skin of the tree. You need a ton of hot water to, to bend the bark, to make it pliable because it stiffens up when it gets cold. But when you warm it up, it gets, like I say, it gets like belt leather. This is the building form. This is our only permanent piece of equipment. And that's like the basic floor of the boat. So this is for a 14 and a half foot canoe. Eastern Lake Superior, Western Lake Superior, they're kind of two distinct types because there's more uh, wild rice on the west end. So you can tell if a boat is from rice country because it'll have the long nose, which is very useful for parting the rice when you're going through the paddies. And they tend to not have a center thwart so you can bend the, the stalks inside. To beat them. But this model here in particular is from, uh, was recorded in Sault Ste. Marie, probably in the middle of the 1800s or something like that. And this is uh, what would be called a work boat back in the day, which working back in those days would have been hunting and fishing for a living. You can fit two people in it and you can put some gear in it, but it's still small enough to solo. So they called this a work boat. Or when uh, Europeans showed up, then it would be called a hunter's canoe. The signature of a boat is the end piece here. The shape of the end is, that kind of tells you what band of uh, people that it came from. So when the boat comes around the corner on the river, you can see the profile of the end of the boat, and then you can, you know, whether you need to put the kettle on or you should get the shotgun out. This system is designed to be done by nomads, semi-nomadic people, so that's why you build them on the ground. In the old days, the people would have just knocked them out really fast because this would have been the F-150 pickup of the day. So the building frame defines the floor, the bottom of the boat, and the length of it and stuff. The gunwale assembly, that stays in the boat. This is the in-whale, just where it's in the stems. That's all stitched together with the basswood bark. And then you have these little pegs here, this tells you how deep the boat will be. So each one of these spots has a little peg that sets the height of the gunnel, the in whale. And so the only permanent parts, the building form and a set of those pegs with the marks on it, that gives you all the dimensions you need to know. So you see, you always put the marks on there so you know where each of the pegs go. And that way you can come up with basically the same boat every time you build it again. And then the rest of it's pretty much done by eye and measurements off your hand or a stick or, or something like that. It's all done by eye. There's nothing, there's not a straight line in a boat like this. So we set this up, we pound all the stakes in the ground so the holes will be there at the proper angles and everything. There's a straight string on the bottom that will help us line the bark up. Then we're going to pull all this apart. all cedar split out of a tree trunk. You have to find the perfect cedar to split a 20 foot two by two. 
And the only danger is when you pound the stakes back in, there's usually a toad in every one of these holes. Well, a tree like this is probably 75 years old or so, maybe 100. Every year it adds on another tissue thin uh, layer of the of bark like this, which is stretchy. Because as the tree gets bigger, the outer layers have to keep stretching. That's why it peels off like that. And so you need something that's at least an eighth of an inch thick, if not better. Because the bark's waterproof, but the tree can breathe through these little slits here. You can't have ones that split up like that. It's like I say, it's one in a thousand or ten thousand trees that has all these qualities it can't delaminate. It has to be flexible. It's really hard to find a tree like that. So you look through a zillion trees to find one that has those qualities. Yeah, so after you, you take it off the tree and then roll it up in the sunshine and you can store it like this bark we harvested maybe ten years ago. Because now we gotta put 40 tons of rocks on here. We'll put the building frame back on top. We'll weight it down with a ton of rocks, hold the bark flat and tight. We're gonna put the gunnel assembly back on top. We'll be putting the stakes in, and then that'll, there'll be batten strips to hold it in place because the bark's gonna wanna always curl up every time it gets dry. All of the characteristics you want a boat to have when it's finished, Rocker is the curve of the bottom coming up and then rise at the ends is the ends tilting up so when you bump into a rock you ride up onto it. You have to decide all that ahead of time and plan ahead so that when you put the ribs in the boat that those qualities will show up. You have to think about all that now. That's it for this week. Be sure you check back in weeks to come for more on the Canoe Project. Thanks for watching and I wish everybody a very Merry Christmas.